Good morning and welcome to our resident lecture. Today, Dr. Franz von Stauffenberg will talk about acute cholecystitis. Franz is our second year resident. He studied at the Semmelweis University in Budapest and joined our hospital two years ago, initially at the Department of Cardiac Surgery and now more than half a year with us. We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Dr. Limani, for the kind introduction. Dear colleagues, today I'm going to talk about one of the most common diseases we see in visceral surgery, which is acute cholecystitis. I'm going to give you a short insight in epidemiology and pathogenesis of the disease, some clinical features, the imaging we use in the diagnosis of the disease, stages in inflammation progress, and the treatment with a highlight on timing and severity grading. There are two main types of acute cholecystitis. We have acute calculus cholecystitis, which makes up to 90 95% of the cases and it's the most common complication of cholelithiasis. It affects more females than males, and it has a peak incidence of in patients with over 50 years of age. Acute acalculus cholecystitis without the presence of a gallstone makes up to 5 to 10% of cases and occurs mainly in critically ill patients. The pathogenesis of acute calculus cholecystitis is, um, as calculus indicates, due to a gallstone. And if there's a passage of the gallstone to the cystic duct, the cystic duct can be obstructed, as you can see here in the picture, which leads to a distension and inflammation of the gallbladder. In over 50% of cases, we have a secondary bacterial infection with intestinal bacteria. Acute acalculus cholecystitis is defined as an acute necroinflammatory disease of the gallbladder without the presence of gallstones. It is referred to as stress cholecystitis and mostly occurs in critically ill patients. It usually results from bile stasis or ischemia, and is associated to trauma, recent surgery, shock, burn, sepsis, and prolonged fasting. Rare causes for calculus cholecystitis is um, are gallbladder polyps and gallbladder cancer. As cholelithiasis is the most common cause for acute cholecystitis, I would like to ask who of the medical students could tell me what the six Fs as risk factors for the development of cholelithiasis stand for. Fat, female, fair, family, 40, fertile. That's right. Here we have a typical patient for the six Fs. She might have a BMI around 30. She's female. She might be fertile in around her 40s. She's fair. And she might have a family history for cholelithiasis. Other risk factors for cholelithiasis are cirrhosis, due to reduced hepatic synthesis and transport of bile salts, high estrogen levels, and impaired gallbladder contraction. Some kind of drugs as well as rapid weight loss. That's why we often see cholelithiasis in patients who underwent bariatric surgery, as well as malabsorption and hemolytic disorders due to high levels of bilirubin. The prevalence of cholelithiasis is about uh, 10 to 20% of the popula adult population in developed countries, and out of, out of those, about 20% are symptomatic. Gallstones are caused by an imbalance in biliary fluid, which has, which has lithogenic and dissolving agents and due to impaired gallbladder emptying, leading to biliary sludge and bile stasis. Whenever you see a patient with symptomatic cholelithiasis, it is already an indication for elective cholecystectomy. So how do patients with acute cholecystitis present to us? They will tell you about having a right upper quadrant pain, which is typically more severe and prolonged than in biliary colic. It's lasting over six hours. There's a postprandial aggravation and it might radiate to the right scapula. They may also have fever, malaise, and loss of appetite, and present themselves with nausea and vomiting. So one question to the residents. There's one clinical examination which is nearly pathognomic for cholecystitis. What is the name of the sign I'm talking about, and how do you define it? The Murphy sign. Yes, the Murphy sign is right. And this is defined as a sudden pausing during inspiration upon depalpation of the right upper quadrant due to pain. As you can see on the picture, during inspiration, the gallbladder is pushed towards the examiner's hand, which is inducing pain. This is why the patient stops uh, inhaling and um, yeah, stops the inspiration process. It is important to know that it can be falsely negative in patients over 60 years of age. In laboratory studies, we will see a leukocytosis as well as an elevation of CRP. We might see a mild elevation of AST and ALT due to inflammation of the liver next to the gallbladder, while signs of cholestasis are uncommon because the obstruction is only limited to the cystic duct. We might see a mild elevation of amylase, but be careful if you see elevation of lipase or amylase over three times the norm, 
which indicates the um, important differential diagnosis of acute biliary pancreatitis. Other differential diagnoses are biliary colic, which presents with a constant dull right upper quadrant pain lasting under six hours, and there's no fever or systemic signs of inflammation. Cholidocholitiasis presents also like cholestasitis with a pain over six hours, but there's also no fever, and we have signs of cholestasis. The cholangitis presents with the charcot trias, which is defined as abdominal pain in right upper quadrant, high fever coming with leukocytosis and CRP rising, as well as jaundice with other factors of cholestasis. So the diagnostic criteria for acute cholestasitis are local signs of inflammation, which we see in the positive Murphy sign, and in the right upper quadrant pain or tenderness, as well as the systemic signs of inflammation, fever, leukocytosis, and rise of CRP, and imaging findings, which, where we can use sonography, CT, MRI, and HIDA scan. We can state a suspected diagnosis if there's one or more local signs of inflammation plus one or more systemic signs of inflammation, and we can talk about a definite diagnosis if we add any typical imaging finding. So for imaging, we use mainly sonography. It is the preferred initial imaging modality with a sensitivity of 81% and a specificity of 83%. In imaging, we would find a galbada wall thickening, a distension, a double wall sign due to wall edema, and we might find pericholocystic free fluid as well as the presence of gallstone or sludge in um, calculus cholecystitis. So who of the residents can tell me or can describe me what we see in the sonography picture? Yeah, I would say um, some of the signs that you already mentioned. I think we have a stone, maybe a bit uh, sludge around it, and uh, the gallbladder seems distended and has uh, the threefold layering. Very good. Here in the yellow area, we see the, the gallstone. Behind in the hatched yellow area, we have sludge. The greenish area is an inflammation of the hepatic tissue next to the gallbladder. And we have the, the free folded wall with a hypoechoic layer between two hyperechoic layers due to edematous tissue in the gallbladder wall. The wall can be seen here very good again, where you have the three different types of wall. CT scan can also be used in a diagnosis of acute cholecystitis with a sensitivity of 94% and a specificity of 59%. Indications for CT scan are if we have an, an uh, unclear clinical diagnosis, for example, a patient presenting with acute abdomen, or if we have inconclusive ultrasound findings, for example, in severely obese patients or patients with chylaiditi signs, so the gallbladder can't be seen. In contraindication to CT, we can also use MRI, which takes longer, and it has a sensitivity of 85% and a specificity of 81%. A test we rarely use in this institution is the HIDA scan, the hepatoimmunodeacetic acid scintigraphy, which is actually the preferred confirmatory test if ultrasound findings are inconclusive. It has a very high sensitivity of 96% and a specificity of 90%. We intravenously inject a radioactive tracer, which is selectively uptaken by the hepatocytes, then excreted into bile, and it can be visualized in the gallbladder via a gamma camera. In the normal finding, you would see the gallbladder being visualized within four hours, as you can see in the picture, as the gallbladder is slowly filling up with the tracer. In acute cholecystitis, where you have an, an obstruction of the cystic duct, the gallbladder cannot be visualized because the tracer can't add the gallbladder. So bringing together all the four imaging modalities that this, uh, I've, we have discussed so far, of their sensitivity and specificity, I've um, already stated, it is um, advised to start with sonography and to add different imaging modalities depending on sonography finding. Due to lack of time, I will not in detail talk about the pros and cons right now. So if we don't diagnose or treat cholecystitis early enough, there are different stages and in inflammation progress as we can see. One of those is chronic cholecystitis, which presents with recurrent symptoms which are typically less severe and often self-limiting. Chronic cholecystitis is due to recurrent attacks of acute cholecystitis, as well as to gallstones because they chronically irritate the gallbladder mucosa. There also is a possibly association to Helicobacter pylori. In sonography, we can see a thickened wall without signs of acute uh, infection, and we might see or should probably see cholelithiasis. In HIDA scan, a delayed vis visualization of the gallbladder can indicate a chronic cholecystitis. An important complication is the development of a porcelain gallbladder, which is an important risk factor for gallbladder cancer. 
Elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy is the treatment of choice for chronic cholecystitis. The most common complication of acute cholecystitis is gangrenous cholecystitis uh, in up to 26% of patients. Um, due to increased gallbladder distension, there's an ischemic mural necrosis caused by vascular compromise. It can lead to perforation, and the clinical appearance is similar to acute cholecystitis, but patients will present in a worse general condition and with leukocytosis over 15,000. It is associated to elderly patients and diabetes mellitus. Treatment of choice would be emergency laparoscopic cholecystectomy with an increased risk of conversion. In imaging, you can see a gangrenous cholecystitis by intraluminal membranes, as you can see here in sonography, and by a strided thickening and asymmetry of the wall, as you can see in the CT scan, and alternating areas of high and low attenuation, as you can see here. Gallbladder perforation is typically to ischemic necrosis. Um, the symptoms will progress rapidly. We will see patients with uh, signs of generalized peritonitis, and it can lead to pericholocystic and um, hepatic abscesses. On imaging, we would see a focal defect in the gallbladder wall, and we might see an extraluminal stone. Empiric antibiotic therapy for biliary infection, as well as the emergency laparoscopic cholecystectomy, would be the treatment of choice. A rare but life-threatening complication is the uh, emphysematous cholecystitis. Symptoms already also progress rapidly, and we have air within the gallbladder wall caused by gas-forming bacteria. It's mostly seen in elderly diabetic men and is associated with early gangrene and perforation of the gallbladder. We have to administer broad-spectrum IV antibiotics with anaerobic coverage, and in low surgical risk patients, we should do emergency laparoscopic cholecystectomy, in high-risk patients, we should do percutaneous cholecystostomy. In sonography, in the blue and yellow area, you can see the wall in the gallbladder lumen. Next to it on the arrow, you can see it in the CT scan. Gallbladder empyema, it's defined as a distended pus-filled gallbladder with, um, due to a bacterial superinfection due to stagnant bile. And the imaging findings on, on sonography and CT are non-specific as the pus can, uh, can resemble sludge, so MRI can be helpful to state the diagnosis. Empiric antibiotic therapy followed by emergency laparoscopic cholecystectomy or percutaneous drainage uh, is the treatment of choice. And a special case is the development of a cholecystoenteric fistula, where you have a communication between the gallbladder lumen and ejectant bowel due to gallbladder perforation or pressure necrosis from large gallstones. It can cause a gallstone ileus, and you can see it here in the X-ray on the arrow, you see the dilated bowel with um, a stone in it. And in the CT, can CT scan, you can see aerobilia due to air arising from the bowel lumen to the gallbladder. Treatment of choice would be enterolithotomy with or without cholecystectomy and closure of the fistula, depending on the surgeon. <laughs> So in the following slides, I will talk about the treatment of acute cholecystitis while highlighting the right timing of treatment in different stages of the disease. As I have already said, we mainly use laparoscopic cholecystectomy. It is the gold standard for your acute cholecystitis. It is the most common abdominal surgery in Switzerland and is performed about 12,000 times a year. It reduces postoperative pain and shortens length of hospital stay as any minimally invasive surgery does. But of course, in complicated cases, we have to converse to open surgery. One of the important questions of the last years is what is the right timing? When should we perform laparoscopic cholecystectomy? The 2013 ACDC study was a landmark trial defining the right timing of uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy in acute cholecystitis. It was a randomized, prospective, open-label parallel group trial, including 618 patients. Nearly all of those got antibiotics for at least two days, and half of the patients were randomized to the immediate laparoscopic cholecystectomy group, receiving surgery within 24 hours of uh, hospitalization. The other half were randomized delayed laparoscopic cholecystectomy group um, who got an initial conservative treatment of antibiotics and elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy after 7 to 45 days. The outcomes showed that the morbidity rate was significantly lower in the immediate laparoscopic cholecystectomy group, and there was also a significantly shorter hospital stay and lower costs in the immediate group. There was no difference in, conversation rates, in conversion rates. So immediate laparoscopic cholecystectomy is the preferred approach we should choose. But what shall we do in patients with high risk, long symptom duration before admission, and complicated cholecystitis? 
In 2018, the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma stated that we should do early laparoscopic cholecystectomy within 10 days of onset of symptoms, preferably within the first 24 to 72 hours. Patients with low surgical risk should get this therapy. Delayed laparoscopic cholecystectomy should be done in patients with high surgical risk or with symptom durations over 10 days before admission. It should be performed 45 days after the re resolution of symptoms. In high-risk patients, which are not responding to antibiotics, we should perform gallbladder drainage, and we can choose percutaneous cholecystostomy or endoscopic gallbladder stenting. Empiric antibiotic therapy should be suggested as supportive care in any of the cases, and in uncomplicated cholecystitis, we can discontinue antibiotics after the procedure. In 2018, an international group published the Tokyo guidelines about the management of acute cholecystitis based on numerous clinical studies from many researchers and clinicians from all over the world. They established a severity grading and corresponding treatment options. Grade one describes mild cholecystitis, where there's no evidence of systemic organ dysfunction or severe gallbladder disease. Grade two, with moderate cholecystitis, we also have no evidence of systemic organ dysfunction, but we have the presence of at least one sign of severe gallbladder disease, which are symptom duration over 72 hours, a white blood cell count over 18,000, as well as a palpable tender right upper quadrant mass, and signs of significant local inflammation on imaging studies. Grade 3, severe cholecystitis, adds a dysfunction of at least one systemic organ system, which are cardiovascular, neurologic, respiratory, renal, hepatic, or hematologic. So in grade 1, when we have patients with low surgical risk, we should perform all early laparoscopic cholecystectomy within 72 hours of the onset of symptoms. In patients with high surgical risk, we should administer antibiotics preoperatively and do early laparoscopic cholecystectomy if feasible. We can discontinue antibiotics 24 hours after surgery. In patients with a, with a too high risk for early laparoscopic cholecystectomy, we should perform delayed laparoscopic cholecystectomy and provide initial antibiotics until symptomatic improvement. In grade two, where we have the presence of at least one sign of severe gallbladder disease, treatment should be given in an advanced medical center with expert surgeons in difficult laparoscopic cholecystectomy. We should uh, administer antibiotics preoperatively in any case. And if there's an improvement from the antibiotic therapy, in patients with low surgical risk, we should do early laparoscopic cholecystectomy and discontinue antibiotics 24 hours after surgery. In patients with high surgical risk, we should perform delayed laparoscopic cholecystectomy and continue initial antibiotics until symptomatic improvement. If there's no improvement with uh, antibiotic therapy initially, we should do an ur urgent gallbladder drainage followed by an elective interval cholecystectomy and should um, continue initial antibiotics for seven days. In grade three, where we also have a dysfunction of at least one organ system, uh, treatment should be administered in an advanced medical center with ICU care and expert laparoscopic surgeons. Antibiotics in general support of care as well as hemodynamic and respiratory support should be established preoperatively. In patients with low surgical risk, we should perform early laparoscopic cholecystectomy if they are responding to the initial therapy and continue antibiotics for four to seven days after surgery. In high surgical risk patients, we should do urgent gallbladder drainage followed by an elective interval cholecystectomy or observation if the patients will have, still have too high risk for surgery. We should continue antibiotics for a total of seven days. So in summary, I want to state that acute calculus cholecystitis is the most common form of cholecystitis. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy is the gold standard for acute cholecystitis. We should administer empiric antibiotic therapy preoperatively and dis discontinue it postoperatively in mild cholecystitis. We should perform laparoscopic cholecystectomy as soon as possible. And if not possible, we should perform gallbladder drainage in complicated cholecystitis or high-risk patients and schedule delayed elective cholecystectomy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, common disease, uh, but not always well understood or even well uh, treated. I think the basic of that is to really understand the pathogenesis and then come all this classification and what you do. When you say acute cholecystitis is the most common form of cholecystitis, that's not correct. I mean, the it depends on how you define cholecystitis. That's a, that's a complicated development of, 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 uh, of gallstones and acute cholecystitis. So the pathogenesis of the acute cholecystitis, as you mentioned, is an obstruction of the cystic duct. It's not an infection. It starts by this, then there is some stasis in the gallbladder 
gallbladder and then secondary infection and the other disease that need to be absolutely differentiated because if it's not the case that's what you show in this diagram if exactly if the other one who uh, should not be uh, confused with because the treatment is exactly the opposite and can lead to death of the patient is cholangitis and that is the opposite with an open cystic duct usually the stone can go through and is blocked in the, the holetocus, and then you have infection with the bilirubin and the triad that you mentioned. So that, I think, for the, the young surgeon is the first thing always to remember and to differentiate, because if you do a cholecystectomy in a patient with cholangitis, patient may just die, particularly if you don't have the right antibiotic in this. So that needs to be very clearly differentiated, and that's why, historically, now the HIDA scan is not performed. I'm not even sure in many centers you even have this test anymore, uh, because that was the one to diagnose the, the reason, which is patency of the cystic duct. That's what you do with this uh, HIDA scan, which we don't do today, and I don't think it's available in most centers in the U.S. Or, or with us, but this is the one who try to, uh, uh, to detect this. So I think that's the first major point, I think, to differentiate acute cholecystitis or gallstone disease. Often it's, we have the label of acute cholecystitis as it's just migration of a stone which pass with temporary elevation of the cholestatic parameter and goes away. So it's not always easy and as you have uh, shown now here the ultrasound is usually the way uh, to differentiate that uh, you do and then you will see thickening of the gallbladder and other sign and inflammation that goes in one or the other uh, uh, direction. I think you, you should that. Importantly, and I can say what we do here, this study and this consensus or this discussion among uh, experts from Japan was interesting, but show that is a case by case, then you need to take into account many factors in cholecystitis, particularly how sick is the patient, what's the risk of surgery, in this, uh, and the timing from the beginning of the sample. So that still remain the, the key. So it's case by case, basically. In this hospital, we have a policy which goes in this direction and many years to go as soon as possible in these cases. We love to go within 72 hours or 24 hours in many centers. It's not always e feasible because availability of operating room, etc. And if you do during the night, study being done is mainly not be done by the expert surgeon and you have other complications. So here there is a balance between availability of surgeon with expense. It's not an easy operation and can be a very difficult residue. But then the philosophy is to do as soon as positive uh, as possible in the early uh, elective schedule or that's it. And then when we are between these three days and seven days, what do we do, etc. That's been that's not clear. And the randomized study did not answer that question. What do you do at day five? We still have a policy here to go and to do it, knowing that the risk is higher. You speak about drainage, that's where it's important of the gallbladder. The drainage for us is usually laparoscopy and debulking. I am against the drainage per, per transhepatic or whatever drainage cholecystostomy. There's a lot of complication. Drainage is often not optimal. They can be bleeding, and there is more risk, in my opinion, that to go with a laparoscopy and do a debulking. And that's where you need an experienced surgeon here, because when you go and see this absolutely necrotic gallbladder, don't know what to do. I mean, to try to do the standard cholecystectomy may, in, may in, uh, go to a bile duct injury and a huge problem. We see every year a few of these cases. So here, <coughs> the treatment is just to do a debulking. You take the entire wall, put the drain, and out. Even if you let the cystic duct open, most of the time, at least half of the time, it will be, be closed, and it's closed anyway with the pathogenesis, or then you can go later by endoscopy, et cetera, in this situation. So I think that, I mean, your presentation was very good. I think it's a complex disease, and the take-home message also for surgery is always to have an expert surgeon available in case anything comes. Conversion is in no way a complication. This is not new here, uh, but usually with ex in expert hand, you can solve that also by the laparoscopically, but if you don't have this experiment, you should also do open surgery and, and debulking. I don't know if there is any uh, question. I just want to make this uh, comment here. Okay, thank you.